Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Antonia Tigre. I'm the Deputy Director of GNHRE. And on behalf of GNHRE and UNEP, I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, session of our summer winter school. Um, you know, just a couple of housekeeping things before we start. We are recording this session. So uh, if you don't want to be recorded, just keep your videos off. Uh, and we are going to have a breakout session. So we'll stop the recording. Um, after these first presentations, and then um, and then you can speak freely during the breakout sessions because that part won't be recorded. Um, we also are going to enable captions, so if anyone needs to use that, feel free to to do so. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it for housekeeping. Uh, oh, the the last thing is that if you are not a GNHRE member, I'd like you to encourage to apply. You can look it up on our website. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it to you guys to to continue for now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for that. Just hoping, can you see the slides okay on the screen? A thumbs up or a nod. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so hi all. Um, welcome to the transitioning from the past through the present to potential futures of knowledge hierarchies in ocean biodiversity governance research uh, panel. My name is Dr. David Wilson. I am a lecturer in history at the University of Strathclyde and co-investigator on One Ocean Hub, where I focus largely on the history and leg legacies of colonialism within ocean governance. Before delving into the main panel presentations and discussion today, I thought it would be useful just to provide a bit of background to the panel and how it all came about. At present, there is a group of One Ocean Hub researchers, mostly from within the Hub's early career researcher network, who are co-writing a paper titled Reflections on the Past, Present and Potential Futures of Knowledge Hierarchies in Ocean Biodiversity Governance Research. We've been working on this paper for a few months now, which has really provided us with the space to discuss and share our own perspectives and approaches towards knowledge hierarchies. And what we quickly found is that we are all engaging and reflecting on knowledge hierarchies, but are often doing so in quite different ways and also coming at knowledge hierarchies from quite different perspectives. One reason that this panel came about is that the authors of this paper all come from different disciplinary and institutional backgrounds and are also working within very different contexts. This includes marine scientists, historians, art-based practitioners, anthropologists, lawyers, social scientists and others. And we're drawn from case studies surrounding children's rights within ocean climate governance women's knowledge within small-scale fisheries in Ghana, natural capital in the deep sea, the inclusion of dispossessed indigenous groups within ocean biodiversity decision-making in Namibia, and the use of art to challenge knowledge hierarchies in courts and classrooms in South Africa. Across these disciplines and contexts, we are all engaging with and attempting to address or break down knowledge hierarchies, but at the same time, we are often finding it quite difficult to draw a clear narrative from the different ways that we are interrogating and addressing the imbalances created by knowledge hierarchy. There we go. Our working definition is that knowledge hierarchies refer to the systematic ordering, ranking and valuation of knowledge and its production according to the perceived authority, legitimacy or status of that knowledge within decision making at different levels. Such knowledge hierarchies and associated processes of knowledge production are steeped within histories of colonization and the parallel development of environmental marine sciences and social sciences, as well as marine sciences and, sorry, as well as Western dominated conservationism. This means that such knowledge hierarchies are heavily embedded in the very disciplines that we are trained and working in, whether that's through emphasis on certain types of evidence on the dominance of concepts of objective knowledge, or even on the very notions of where knowledge is actually produced or generated. This means that as researchers addressing modern ocean biodiversity and conservation challenges, we must not only be aware of the history of knowledge extraction, imposition and assumptions within our fields, we must also actively work to continuously acknowledge and address these in our work. 
Yeah, even within research that recognises the need to implement paradigm shifts and transformations, knowledge hierarchies have proven to be multi-layered and perpetuating, even within the context of conscious attempts to address them through such methods as the elevation, integration, or bringing together of diverse knowledge systems. Such methods can reproduce knowledge hierarchies, whether through the continued processes of knowledge extraction or through the methods of weighing up or testing different types of knowledge against each other. These are issues that cannot simply be recognised and addressed, but need constant interrogation and revisiting as research progresses. And so this panel is an opportunity for some of our collaborators to share their perspectives on knowledge hierarchies and how they have been approaching these within their specific research context. But we also want to use this space to engage other perspectives on knowledge hierarchies to understand how you all who are attending this panel perceive and work through or against or with knowledge hierarchies in your own context and work. So today's panel will proceed as follows with the program on the screen at the minute. So after I finish speaking, I'll pass over to our panelists who are going to give short presentations based on their perspectives on knowledge hierarchies in order to prompt some discussion. We'll have a Q&A following all of the presentations. So we'll have all the presentations first and then we'll have the Q&A after for about 15 minutes or so. And then we will go into breakout groups really as a chance to start to explore some of the issues that came up in the conversations and some of the, your own perspectives on knowledge hierarchies as well. Then we'll come back from the breakout groups and have a bit of a discussion um, on what was covered therein. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. There we go. And I'm going to pass over to our first presenter, who is Dr. Holly Nina from the University of Plymouth, who is going to speak on challenging knowledge hierarchies with a natural capital approach. Dr. Holly Nina is a research fellow at the University of Plymouth, and her research focuses on the use and influence of knowledge and decision making processes in marine contexts. Over to you, Holly. Thanks. Thanks, David. I'm just sharing my screen. I'll just wait until I think that's ready. Is that okay? Can everyone see my presentation? Yes. Yeah, lovely. Um, so I'll just launch straight in and try and get this done because I'm setting everyone with a 45 minute presentation. Um, so hopefully we can get it done at five. <laughs> um, natural um, capital uh, approaches here. So this is just based on some of the research that we've been doing at the University of Plymouth, um, based in looking at the deep sea and areas beyond national jurisdiction, which are um, those regions outside of um, state sort of um, control, if you like. Um, so beyond 200 nautical miles. Um, so what are natural capital approaches? So natural capital approaches describe or take account of the ecological system with a lens that tends to include humans as part of that ecological system. It describes the building blocks of the ecosystems, um, which are the biotic species and habitats and abiotic rock, oceanic currents, the water column, um, and sort of focuses them as assets that interact to provide ecosystem services. Um, and ecosystem services are the, are the flows of benefits, such as nutrition obtained from fish stocks, um, that flow to people and then are experienced by people. Um, these ecosystem services may be converted into benefits by the use of other capitals, including human, financial, or techno technological capitals, um, such as the financial backing needed to invest in boats um, or technology to catch fish, and then the ports and roads needed to land and realize those economic benefits. Um, but there are also those benefits that flow in diffusely to people that people experience. So um, that would be um, climate regulation. So we all experience habitable conditions that, that allow humanity to thrive. So a natural capital approach marks a change from thinking about ecology in isolation. It enables the entire system and the linkages so intrinsic to human and planetary well-being to be made visible and considered within decision making. Um, it's also inherently flexible and allows different types of information or knowledge to be included. So, for example, you may not have a quantified way of describing a spiritual connection to nature, but that doesn't make it less valuable or less important um, to include in decision making. So using such an approach 
we advocate and you can consider all these values if, if that's what you want to do but it's not without its controversy and and perhaps well a lot of my colleagues um are probably in this camp in terms of uh, having having thoughts about the natural capital approach so um natural capital approaches um tend to be driven and have been developed perhaps those based with an ecological background or have some sort of ecological training um, and they've been developed in response to the fact that the value of nature has not traditionally been included within economic budgets and cost benefit analysis and then decisions around um, economic trajectories and this has led to current trends of biodiversity biodiversity decline where economic development has been premised on huge degrees of extraction of nature fish um, mined material and um, for example the use of the ocean as a receiver of a receiver and processor of waste. Um, and without the inclusion of this value um, within these costs when you're making decisions and, and an assumption that these benefits are limitless and free, um, which they aren't. And, and um, proponents um, articulate that the use of a natural capital approach can support a more explicit consideration of the different connections and, and these values, and therefore has the potential to democratize decision making that implicates biodiversity in some form, as in is making these making these costs to nature of nature and then people visible, and thus has a, um, has the potential to challenge knowledge hierarchies. Um, but from other disciplines, there are arguments that a natural capital framing perpetuates a capitalist agenda in framing nature as an asset, asset or having a value which often gets interpreted as a financial value. And, and where this does happen, it can be deeply problematic in terms of attempting to understand spiritual and cultural relationships to nature, which can be deeply held with nature understood as inseparable. Not only do the methods commonly employed to integrate these values into frameworks um, weakly capture what are often rich and complex connections, um, the methodologies are fairly um, basic. Um, one example is um, willingness to pay. Um, I can talk about that in a bit, a bit more detail later if people want to talk about that. Um, but they're basically a creek critiqued as making these values, these connections amenable to exchange. Um, whereas when men, with many of these relationships are intrinsic, foundational, any assumptions around exchange and fungibility are, are, are really very likely to be incorrect um, and inappropriate. Um, and another critique relates to the detail needed to adequately adequately represent many human nature connections and the associated place-based specificities of these relationships. Um, and that such frameworks are really unlikely to be compatible with presenting um, or, or able to include this, this really rich data. Um, if you think some of these um, ecosystem services we're talking about affect global society and, and whether they're actually fit for purpose in terms of integrating those deeply held connections um, for all of global society. Um, so in summary, and I'm being really brief here, um, but criticisms broadly relate to a simplification or reduction of nature in order to facilitate transactions through cost benefit analysis. Um, such simplification does not just relate to qualitative information or values. It's also inherent to many impact assessment and decision making tools in marine contexts because of the high uncertainty in knowledge and complexity envir of environmental functioning um, within marine environments that operates at all, virtually all spatial and temporal scales um, that then give rise to ecosystem services and benefits. Uh, because there is a relative lack of ecological understanding of ecological function and the delivery of ecosystem services, often proxies or indicators for biodiversity are used as a best guess. And uh, while these approaches are considered scientifically acceptable for monitoring change, the use of these proxies um, is, often, is often extended to legitimizing transactions whereby losses are permitted in exchange for compensation, you know, with either other, other biodiversity or, or finance. Um, and generally, such transactions um, equate to a loss of biodiversity, um, as, a, as these calculations are really unable to account for the complexity and place-based specificity of biotic and abiotic relationships that give rise to biodiversity. So in light of all of this, there is a critique 
that um, natural capital approaches um, are too pragmatic. They do not present a big enough challenge to current modes of capitalist governance. They're sort of feeding a beast, if you like. Um, and because of this, they accept the status quo and do not force the transformational change that's needed um, for sustainable and equitable ocean governance. So how we think at the University of Plymouth, and maybe I'm sort of reflecting a little bit from my own perspective, um, is, is natural capital approaches can challenge these, these sort of now knowledge hierarchies. Um, so we, our work is focused, as I mentioned, outside 200 nautical miles in the remote ocean. So these regions are characterised by uncertainties. There is very little ecological data available, huge unknowns in how natural capital function in terms of an interact to deliver critical benefits to humans, both diffuse and direct. And here in this image, you can see just a few um, in which this, these areas are um, implicated. Um, and the relative importance of how these diff different assets or these building blocks of the ecosystems located in these remote oceans act together and how they control their health or their relative condition controls the delivery or flows of these ecosystem services. Um, and despite the inaccessibility and lack of understanding of these regions, extraction and human pressure is being exerted on the natural capital in these areas through climate change, fishing, shipping, emerging deep sea mining industry. And it's really common with assessments of impact for these potential risks um, of, of, of these activities or pressures in these regions to be viewed as insignificant because they're large spaces, there's not many people there, they're probably in relatively good, best, good condition, and they don't affect anyone because they're far away. Um, um, and, and, that's it. and that's kind of despite uh, overall trends of biodiversity decline globally um, and particularly um, in, 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 within the ocean. So um, given that we know that key attributes of marine functioning are premised on, on a connected medium, so the, the whole global ocean, some species undertaking huge migrations, global heat transport occurring at a basin scale um, and beyond, we categorically know that these categorically know that these regions are important in the delivery of ecosystem services and they're essential for thriving societies and human well-being um, and that these regions and natural capital assets need to be accounted for within decision making so our challenge is well what can we do to make to make these values visible these connections visible so that we know potential pressures are significant or pose potential risk so there are A, B and J, are, so these regions are a good example to demonstrate how we believe natural capital approaches can tackle knowledge hierarchies because there are, there, there are no relationships that are easily describable or quantified or in statistical terms. Um, and many of the arguably or, or most important benefits um, are poorly understood in terms of their ecological controls. So as an example here, we have looked at what information is available in ABNJ to understand, particularly the risks um, to diffuse benefits. So those that global society, or, or perhaps the most foundational benefits, if you like, coming for for global society from these regions. And 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 here the the information that perhaps we do have, you can see in black, and that in grey is what we don't have. Um. So, but given that for many of um. So, so we don't have much of the information, yet, yet what we do know is that these benefit, flow, benefit flows do exist and broadly what they look like. Um, similarly, we know what pressures are occurring for our human activities. And again, we know broadly what sort of assets and in some cases which specific assets these are acting on. And we know for certain what the controls on these pressures look like. So in compiling all of this information, ranging from descriptive to highly uncertain, we can paint a picture of the system and identify key areas of risk as identified by gaps or ineffective governance. So basically connections between the human pressures all the way through to the benefit flows that people are, people are experiencing without the specific information in the middle. So this example shows the flexibility of a natural capital approach to include all types of information and therefore challenge assertions that the only information that can legitimately be included in economic decision making is that which is statistically certain. And that statistical certainty is the only driver of action to avert biodiversity degradation. So that was a really whistle stop tour, but that's why I think natural capital approaches can be useful and can challenge knowledge hierarchies. Anyway, let me stop sharing so we can move on to the next.
um, presentation. Thank you so much, Holly. That was really interesting. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Have I stopped sharing? Yeah, you're stopped sharing. Don't worry. You have stopped sharing. All good. Um, as I said in the chat as well, please do introduce yourself in the chat if you want to, um, and we'll also have the Q&A at the end of presentations, but you can add um, questions in the chat while the presentations are ongoing, and we'll try to pick them up at the end as well. So our second presentation comes from Marley Mudeni samuel who is a PhD candidate at the Glasgow School of Art in the School of Simulation and Visualisation. Her research revolves around digital ocean heritage and the intricate dynamics of ocean knowledge, culture and relationships, while also exploring equitable access to ocean information and digital technologies. She is currently interested in digital transformation, digital heritage, innovation and extended reality to facilitate access and the preservation of knowledge and cultural heritage. And Marley's presentation is titled Ocean and Coastal Communities, Imperative of Indigenous and Experiential Knowledge. Over to you, Marley. Thanks. Thank you so much, David. Um, can you all see my presentation fine? Yep, so they're fine. Awesome. So um, as David mentioned, my name is Marley Mudeni Samuel, and I'm a PhD candidate with the Glasgow School of Art. My research focuses on um, ocean digital heritage, but today I'm going to be talking about ocean and coastal communities, focusing on the imperative of indigenous and experiential knowledge. So for um, a brief overview, okay. So for a brief overview, I'm going to be focusing on my research context, which is in Namibia, followed by coastal communities and the intense relationships that they have with the ocean, and then the challenges that they also face. And then I'll be talking about the relevance of indigenous and experiential knowledge. And then lastly, um, the role of technology when it comes to knowledge preservation. So my research is focused in Namibia, a southwestern um, African country that is bordering South Africa and Angola. And my research works with coastal communities in Wafish Bay and Swakopmund, who usually have long-standing knowledge and often unique relationships with the ocean, um, which they depend on for their livelihoods, cultural practice, and identities. So my research aims to then surface their ocean knowledge, cultural practices, and the relationships that the coastal communities have with the ocean, while also examining how technology then um, can support state coastal communities in documenting or recording their ocean knowledge, their culture and relationships for posterity, preservation, and to improve ocean conservation. Now a little bit about ocean um, ocean relationships. So many coastal communities have deep rooted relationships and connections with the ocean, which are referred to as ocean relationalities. And they can be cultural, spiritual, medical, physical, emotional, mental, but most importantly, for economic sustenance. Um, Holly previously also kind of spoke about them. Now I'm going to give um, three examples of communities out there in the world that rely on the, on the ocean very much, which kind of speaks to their deep-rooted relationships with the ocean. Firstly, um, it's the um, seashell collectors found in Namibia who engage in the practice of collecting seashells by the beach shores, which they use to create um, cultural and traditional jewelry. Some of them also use it for contemporary jewelry, but mostly for the traditional ones, which are very important to one of the tribes in, the, in Namibia, which is the Awambo tribe. And they go through a rigorous process to create these um, cultural jewelry. So as you can see in this picture, the woman is kind of holding them up after a whole process of grinding them, put um, kind of putting holes in the, in the seashells, putting them on like wire um like wires as you can see then and then transferring them onto a thread for them to kind of make um the traditional jewelry that I'm speaking about. Then secondly, we have the female armor divers of Japan. They can also be found in Korea and they dive for seafood um, using, I mean, not using traditional diving um, equipment, mostly just relying on traditional techniques for them to um, for them to, uh, techniques and knowledge for them to kind of then get the, the seafood and the ocean resources that they rely on and they kind of depend on for their livelihoods. And then lastly, we have the Ghanaian fisher folk who use a variety of traditional fishing methods, including wooden canoes, which they sometimes make themselves, and nets to harvest fish from the ocean. Now, all these communities have one thing in common. They all rely on indigenous and experiential as well as traditional techniques and knowledge for them to 
kind of practice, uh, to practice these activities uh, that feed back into their livelihoods. And this knowledge has been passed down through generations, and this is the knowledge that they still then practice. It kind of um, kind of circle, um, circles back to their deep, intricate relationships with the ocean. Similarly, these coastal communities face numerous imbalances, impositions, and challenges relating to the ocean. Um, I'm just going to be mentioning of, um, two of them for now. The first one being a lack of representation in decision making. So a lot of decisions are being made about ocean resources and conservation without meaningful impact from the coastal communities, which results in the implementation of policies that do not align with the needs and priorities of these communities. And then secondly, there's also challenges of um, loss of livelihoods. Um, um, that is due to challenges such as overfishing, pollution, the exploitation of ocean resources and climate change, which is the big bang of it all, which then has um, diverse effects on the ocean's ecosystem. And then in turn, it also affects the livelihoods of the coastal communities because they rely heavily on the ocean activities, ocean resources and other things um, that have to do with the, with the ocean. However, regardless of these challenges, some of these coastal communities have always found a way to kind of adapt to these environmental changes, which kind of speaks to their resilience and it also speaks to the knowledge that they have, that they, they have gained or that they have acquired um, through generations or just through experience. Now, the relevance of indigenous and experienced knowledge. Mm. So throughout my research, I've been working with communities in Namibia, as I said, and um, the community members themselves speak about, or the participants that I've been working about, they kind of emphasize the importance of indigenous and experiential knowledge because some of them say they still practice or use the knowledge that they've gained from their parents and their grandparents or the parents from their grandparents and so forth. So it's a whole chain of knowledge that has been passed down. It kind of feeds back into this whole practice. Um, for example, in the Oshuambo culture, like I said, they make the jewelry, as you can see in the picture, that is made out of seashells which is very important to the Oshuambo culture because it kind of links to many cultural customs and practices that are of great significance. So one of the participants from this tribe then say that the ocean provides for us traditionally and spiritually, provides for us seashells that are important for us to uh, for us because they protect us from bad spirits so we usually collect them put them in containers in our rooms as a form of protection and these kind of relationships speaks to a spiritual relationship connected to the ocean whereas one of the other um participants from the top now community which is a marginalized community in namibia so they previously inhabited the seashores of namibia but over the years i um, mean due to colonialism they moved in inland of namibia but they are um, uh, core practices, their core practices many years ago kind of linked back to the ocean because fishing and other ocean activities were part of their um, daily activities and livelihood. So he says that although we are no longer in close proximity to the ocean, there are customs that we still practice to honor and appreciate our ancestors and reaffirm ourselves that we do really come from the ocean. So this kind of speaks to what to why the ocean is really important to these coastal communities and that it holds cultural and spiritual significances for them. And that is also why the knowledge they have, or let's say indigenous experiential, traditional and uh, um, um, technical knowledge that is being gained and passed on is important because it has the capability of um, the capability to help um, contribute to sustainable ocean resource management, to help combat climate change, to foster climate resilience. If you look at how they've kind of adapted to ways in, in, in climate change, but also for ocean conservation. And then the lastly, through collaborative methods um, working with these communities, um, the knowledge that can be gained from them can also inform policies and decision making. Now, just to talk a little bit about knowledge sharing and dissemination and then the role that technology kind of plays in this regard. Um, Lou et al. explains that technology has always played a part in supporting proactive endeavors that safeguard and protect tangible and tangible um, cultural heritage. So the same can be said that um, technology can also then play that role when it comes to ocean knowledge, cultural relationships, or just anything that has to do 
with the ocean and how it can kind of be documented or preserved. So during the research that I've been doing, um, I kind of conducted participatory design and community-based co-design um, workshops over a period of four months, and I had 12 workshops altogether. Now, through these workshops, we now talked about the ocean and how it kind of relates to the coastal communities, why it's important, but then we also talked about how then the knowledge that they have about the ocean in, um, regarding its benefits and what other people can learn from it, how then it can be documented. And so we explore documented reality and how then it can be used to record state existing culture, ocean cultural knowledge, and also to reveal other intricate relationships that these coastal community members have with the ocean. And so from that, we... Um, co-produce an augmented reality application called Efutaletu Sudahurib, which means our ocean, our ocean in two native languages in Namibia, Oshwambo and Pekagova. And the title kind of speaks back to um, when the participants were kind of explaining it, they said it speaks back to their uniqueness as well. And also kind of their, their grounding as Namibians, but also speaks back to the ocean. Um, it also kind of suggests that technology has been the power to um, help share, to give access, to kind of help with education and also advocacy. And it kind of came out through the workshops as well because the participants were like, this application can then um, really work in a sense that other people who do not have access to the ocean or know much about it, they can learn about it through the app or they can kind of have access to the ocean through this information if they do not have access to it, depending um, depending on where they kind of reside. Um, so just to kind of finalize and finish off, um, through new, um, numerous research, um, it's kind of been found that the utilization of participatory and collaborative approaches can be very enlightening. And that's why researchers and institutions should kind of embrace trust, transdisciplinary research and collaborative um, participatory initiatives that incorporate knowledge of all domains in order to create sustainable interventions and, and inclusive um, ocean solutions. Because the ocean is very important to most of these coastal communities. It doesn't just represent like a body of water for them. It represents lived realities, identities, relationships that encompass life, spirituality, mystery, healing, sustenance, a sense of place for them, but importantly, a future for humanity. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mara. That was fascinating. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions as well to come. Um, we're going to move on to our third presentation now. This comes from Dr. Alana Lancaster, who is a lecturer in international environmental and energy law and is the head of the recently formed Environmental Law, Ocean Governance and Climate Justice Unit of the Faculty of Law at the University of the West Indies. And Alana is going to present on contemporary knowledge hierarchies, colonialism and conservation. Thank you. Over to you, Alana. Thank you, David. I, um, there we go. Sorry, here you see my screen. Yep, all good. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. And it's such a pleasure to be on such a wonderful panel <laughs> and to continue the conversation that we have in preparing this really important paper. Uh, I could only get my slides. Okay. So as 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 we lead in in the 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 forthcoming paper, is we highlight that governance from the ocean and its biodiversity are deeply entangled in not only the histories of colonialism, but also parallel developments in environmental, marine and social science, as well as law and Western-centric conservatism. Um, from our, in many respects, the law has been an instrument that has provided a legitimacy uh, to this, the these not the knowledge hierarchies that would have been imposed at the time of 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 colonialism, uh, most notably struck um most notably um 
concepts such as the doctrine of discovery and uh, terra nullis, which have largely been used to justify uh, not only the uh, the expansion of, of, of Western civilizations, uh, but also to marginalize indigenous um, peoples and, and, and subsequently traditional peoples and their knowledge. Uh, because of the the expansion of, 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 of some of these um, constructs, um, we have seen a historic, political, as well as systemic bias across research systems and governance, as well as, as conservation approaches that do not um, take into consideration uh, non-Western approaches. Uh, nevertheless, uh, and while many of these processes are aimed at addressing many of the challenges we find, uh, many of the contemporary planetary threats of the Anthropocene uh, continue, and there's growing impatience with um, the status quo. And as a result, there are clear expressions that the law needs to facilitate uh, a transition from past approaches uh, to facilitate not a more inclusive and mutually respect um, um, knowledge hierarchies which mutually respect um, knowledge co-production or, or, or co-production or even recognize existing um, knowledge systems. And so an example of, of that um, without getting overly legal would be uh, the events which are 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 are, are undergo are underway in the next in this week and next uh, in Hamburg, for example, where um, for, there are hearings in which is uh, what is considered a very landmark, um, a landmark action in regard to climate justice and the ocean. But I can get into that, a discussion of that uh, later or in the questions. Um, so we've seen, as the, in the Anthropocene, we've seen the deepening of, of, of the three, uh, in some respects, the three horsemen of the apocalypse, um, climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. And all three of these exert tremendous pressure on ocean ecosystems and their biodiversity. And consequently, as, as Marley and, and Holly would have highlighted, because of the didactic feedback loops, they exert pressure on, 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 on those um, persons who most rely on them. So there's urgent need to, to, to find solutions which counter these, these threats um, to both oceans and their biodiversity, as well as to meet the needs of human societies. Um, and overwhelmingly, Western approaches have um, focused on expanding scientific knowledge um, in various fields. I've listed a few there. Uh, however, it is clear that despite these innovations and advancements, uh, the, the, the triple planetary crisis looms larger than ever. So there is um need to interrogate, and this has long been the the, the assertion of 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 tw twelve scholars, so uh, scholars at international law who have championed third world and even fourth world approaches to international, uh, the approach international law takes, uh, that is an approach that moves away from from the constructs such as the doctrine of discovery and and terra nullis, and those are just about two, uh, and and the reason I highlighted those two is because of their direct link to both um, the management of ocean spaces and their resources. Um, there's been calls also from anthropologists to um, dismantle systems which mask the legitimization of, um, of, of, of the, the status quo. Now, so therefore addressing the root causes of these um, crises, um, requires 
transitions and transformative approaches. And I should add many of these approaches need to be grounded in interdisciplinarity. I mean, Holly alluded to this in, in her um in her presentation because in many respects um many disciplines um anthropologists lawyers uh marine scientists historians and so on have been coming at uh, there's been the recognition that we tend to be in our silos and i think this is one of the strengths of of the space we have been allowed um mm -hmm. under the one ocean hub mm -hmm. as early career researchers um or early ish career researchers to be exposed and and this is what makes um our discussions and indeed what the discussion that will follow shortly so rich um so there are many illustrations um of um of of how these hierarchies need to be dismantled and 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 indeed as i say um they're 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 several examples of 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 international or or or, or, or groups of, of persons who might have been marginalized and th there are groups at many levels uh from the from the level of states at the level to the grassroots level say to 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 peoples and communities such as indigenous peoples women children and so on now the challenge is that many of these systems have endured through uh, events, historic events, such as the annihilation of indigenous people, slavery, indentureship, <clears throat> assimilation. And also it is important to note that even as, as nationhood or the, 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 the many nations became independent and, and began to build um, their, their, their nations that, um, that, <clears throat> sorry, that uh, dispossession and marginalization still occurred. Um, so as, as I, uh, I think slowly what we have seen at the multilateral environment, so, uh, uh, at the multilateral level is uh, that there needs to be a mobilization of multiple um, and established knowledge systems, values and governance systems to adequately address um, com um, these challenges that are either complementary to or superior in many respects to Western approaches because we often, again, because of historical and other reasons, think um, that Western approaches are superior. And as someone who uh my my background before becoming a lawyer was a scientist we you know you you're told that science you know that once you can prove something in science it's it you know it's immutable but i think when we interrogate many indigenous knowledge systems we may not view them as scientific from a western perspective but indeed uh they're they have sound bases um and it's just a of how we view or, or the perspective review. Um, so a strengthening, um, a strengthening, uh, what do you call it, link or a nexus between ind indigenous knowledge holders and um, the, the, the science. So for example, we're in a decade of ocean science uh, would be required and, 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 and critical to the success of this decade of ocean science will be to incorporate um, indigenous knowledge holders based on de decolonized knowledge co-production and and the concept of of co-production as coined by ostrom was really um conceptualized within the concept construct of common pool resources such as oceans in which um communities and 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 and, and stakeholders can participate and 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 contribute to, to robust governance structures, uh, so, such as those um, at the ocean um, climate nexus, as well as the ocean development and cultural nexus. And as I will highlight shortly that, if my slide would move forward, there the, the have been increased recognition, not only in instruments. So I, I look at, the, at how um, the, the, um, these three three key instruments which 
are critical to ocean governance, have incorporated, have moved uh, progressively to incorporate elements of, of, of traditional and local knowledge systems as, as part of their, um, their approaches. And I, I will identify some, some advances in quasi and, and judicial processes shortly. Um, so the Convention on Biodiversity is perhaps the main instrument which endorses this uh, um, approach among the multilateral environmental agreements. And this is supported by the UN DRIP, the adoption of the UN um, Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, um, and further consolidated by the work of, of, of the, the, the Intergovernmental Working Group um, on bio, um, biological, um, biological, EBS, sorry, I sometimes forget the <laughs> acronyms, as well as the recent Conmin Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and the Nag Nagoya Protocol, which um, while states have been sluggish to, um, to uh, accede to this, it the, the 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 fundamental underpinning of this this agreement is um, access and benefit sharing and equity. Uh, the, the the recently concluded uh, BBNJ agreement is also a, a, a has which um, I think is it, while it it could have perhaps gone further, it is very heartening to see. That the that indigenous peoples and local communities have been incorporated across the text, um, and this it opens the door for human rights approaches, as I will explain shortly. Um, also, the the provision for the strategic environmental assessment on the 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 BBNJ agreement also um, addresses equity issues and incorporates human rights, and finally. The Paris Agreement, as well as the UNFCC, have to some increasing extent. So we have Article Three, as well as Articles Nine and Seven. Oh, sorry, Article Article Three of the Climate Change Convention, Articles Nine and Seven of the Paris Agreement. Um, it it remains to be seen whether Article Eight on loss and damage, in light of the um the decision, the decision at COP twenty seven to establish the loss and damage fund will also uh, provide this avenue. I am cautiously optimistic while being a bit um, skeptical. Um, the, the Paris Agreement of itself has this, a sparse recognition of indigenous and I put in brackets, perhaps local peoples, but um, traditional environmental knowledge has been increasingly referenced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and there are more robust provisions for agency um, in the Sharm El Sheikh implementation plan as supported by the adoption of general comment 26. So in, 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 in wrapping up in regard to human rights, what, what I want to say is that um, the increasingly the, the traditional knowledge and in Incorporating traditional knowledge into our uh, ocean science and decision making and governance has been um, embraced by these the intergovernmental panels of both um, the Convention on Biological Diversity as well as Convention on Climate Change, and this is bookended by many legal instruments and the decisions um, of treaty bodies and judicial and quasi-judicial bodies. And I give some examples there, the judgments, the landmark judgments of the Human Rights Council in Teota and the Torres Islanders, and the Trilogy of Climate Justice hearings, both in front international courts, so that um, would be the, um, the, the, the trilogy of advisory opinions. And then we also have a, a a trilogy of of cases in front of the um, European Court, which are also important, and I view as very important the expansion of 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 Rio Principle Ten on the instruments such as the Escazú Agreement for the Latin American Caribbean region, the Aarhus Convention for the European Union, and even though it's a, a non-binding instrument, the UN. Um, guiding principles um, on business and human rights has infiltrated both into 
agreements such as the Aarhus Convention, but also um, the recent um, uh, due diligence legislation by the, the European Union. Um, so I, what, what I will conclude is I think I'm over my time is that much of the expansion that has occurred in 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 pushing the inclusion of 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 of, of traditional knowledge, so for example, in the Torres Islander this case, it was stressed that culture, the impact on culture, uh, and and uh, and, uh, and that subsequent impact on intergenerational equity by the by 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 not robust climate change measures, I uh, was was uh, against the human rights of the Torres Islands. So much of this um, expansion has occurred under international human rights law or national mechanisms, which adopt a right rate approach than any other normative approach. And I end by saying that um, if we are, uh, assess many of traditional and local knowledge systems that these, th these systems are underpinned by, by principles of equity and, and, and social, uh, social equity and fairness. And therefore, uh, we need to transition and tra transform our knowledge hierarchies in line with this. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Alana. That was excellent. And I think we'll have lots of questions as well. So I'm going to just open the floor to questions right away. Please do raise your hand. You can ask the question live um, if you want to, or you can raise your hand just on the screen. I'll try and catch you that way. Um, or indeed, if you want to rather ask your question via the chat, you can do so as well. Um, so yeah, any questions? Just get the screen up so I can see it. Well, we are kind of thinking about questions and um, maybe write them in the chat. I'll take the chair's prerogative and I'll just ask the first question. So I'm wondering across all the presentations, there was discussion of participatory approaches or the sort of integration of knowledge. And I just wanted to ask a bit more about your own perspectives on participatory approaches and what approaches you've used in your research to engage with different types of knowledge and different um, perspectives on the issues you work on, and then the challenges you've faced in this as well. So I think it's always useful just to hear about the challenges as well as the successes in this. Who wants to go first? I I, I guess I should go. I, I can go first because I, I guess <laughs> from the outset, I should say that law perhaps is not the, the most participatory <laughs> The, the most the discipline that um is participatory based we do a lot of i suppose <laughs> i suppose normative work and and drafting and so on and one of my criticisms usually because as i said i come from a science and then i came into law is that we um usually lawmaking is done or in the past at least lawmaking was done from a very top down approach and and to some extent still is uh so participate you know participation and, and and consultation are were not usually the 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 watchwords um happily we have um in various ways uh, at the national level the main one is the environmental impact assessment which is the one and and also the um, strategic environmental assessment which are the ones i'm more familiar with but um Increasingly, we also have seen the explosion of approaches such as marine spatial planning and so on, which by their very nature require uh, more participation and, 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 and consultation. I, I, but I will say that the challenge is meaningful participation and consultation as opposed to consultation and participation, which checks boxes and so on. And that is... That is um, um, uh, area which which would definitely needs to be developed more because I, I I think from a legal background persons think that it's the role of law is you know to govern and, and introduce order and it's kind of like pushing back against a system to to introduce more participation so. 
So thank you, Alana. Marley, would you like to come in? I see your camera came on. Please. So um, I think some of the challenges because um, the research that I do is heavily grounded in participatory and collaborative work. But some of the challenges that I've experienced, because I'm, I'm, I also kind of take the te technical approach. So my PhD is kind of rooted in the oceans, but it's also rooted in technology and how technology can then preserve ocean knowledge. So in that instance, because I worked with coastal communities, one of the challenges was um, the, the engagement with the technologies, because for most of them, say 60% of them, they've never actually used augmented reality or virtual reality or um, engaged with some of the technologies that we explored. Um, however, because um, my research kind of also adapt adapted like a rapid ethnography approach and we ha I had workshops over a long period of time, 12 workshops to be exact, and I had time to work with these technologies. So some of these challenges were kind of um, alleviated in a sense. I can't say that oh, okay, now they are um, digital literate, all of them. But all I can say is that they did learn a few um, a few things about technology on how to use it, why it's important, and um, also how it can be used to kind of create awareness about things because we co-produced this augmented reality application together, which kind of embedded their knowledge and they came up with all that knowledge. So um, just a little bit about the application. So it kind of holds, um, so what we did is we sat down and we talked about the ocean and then we kind of wanted to know um, how the ocean connects back to the participants. So they brought objects that relate or kind of represent their ocean significance. And those objects were turned into 3D models that were then put in the in the augmented reality app. And then they kind of wrote stories about those objects. And if someone kind of goes through it, they then just kind of narrate or go through the application in that, in that sort. So they kind of had time through that process to learn about it. Um, another challenge at the beginning was more of the language barrier, not from my from my point of view, because um I speak I speak two languages from Namibia, one fluently and the other kind of moderate. Um, but for the participants themselves to kind of express themselves in English, but the platform was available for them to express themselves in whatever language they, they wanted. But because of the collaborative methods that we used and because the, the co-participants themselves were already in, invigorated in that method, they themselves helped through the process. So the research also became a part of them. So whenever someone was struggling, one of the co-participants would be like, oh no, I'm going to sit next to say my math and I'm going to kind of translate for her. I'm going to help her so she can understand what we are doing. So yeah, some of these challenges kind of did surface, but um, we kind of came up with solutions on how to tackle them. That makes sense. Thank you, Marla. That's great. And yeah, I just think that that longer term process that you're speaking on, the actual time investment within building that relationship and also working through different workshops is just so important. Um, and it speaks to that point about meaningful consultation that, that Kathleen's put in the chat, and I'll read it out um, if anyone would like to come in on this question. But what does the panel think are the main barriers to real meaningful consultation and engagement of coastal communities and other marginalised groups more generally? Anyone would like to come in on that? Alan, I think you just answered in the chat, but <laughs> you can read it out if you'd like. No, I give a very low like approach. Um, no, I want. I remember reading this article a few years ago, and um, and it was in regard to fisher folks and their perspectives on oh, fisher folks sorry and their perspective on a consultation process and one of the the statements of one of the, the, the of them stuck with me because um basically he said he or she said that um yes they were invited to the the table to have a discussion but it was like being at a table with um you know, and a meal is being served, but they didn't have cutlery to eat it with. And I think that in many, and I, again, as I said my, in, in the chat, my response is, is looking at it from, uh, uh, I suppose, an, a, 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 a legal approach is that uh, in many respects, um, one of the key areas is to enhance 
access rights, so access to information, access to justice. And because a lot of the issues we're speaking about, uh, it, it, it shouldn't be remediatory justice, but um, a, a, the ability to, 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 involve, to be involved in processes before, as well as to, to stop processes that are not wholesome um or 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 can be destructive and um i really do think that you know so in many in the caribbean region certainly we've incorporated many what is what are supposedly participatory approaches by means of passing it legislation that provide for eias but there are many so the, that's there the the relevant agency may undertake that that work but or, or the, the procedure but the the reality so many things for example as marley referenced language uh, literacy levels uh simple things like you know persons are are out about the business of of making a living so these can act as barriers but in certainly under the English legal system, once the authority can say we tick these boxes, it's difficult to challenge a decision, um, even if it's even if it's it's prejudicial to to, tra to keep traditional and local communities and indigenous communities. So that's my very lawyer like <laughs> response, and I'm I'm sure there, it's much wider than that. I could tell you. Thank you, Anne. I think that it's so important, just just especially the point that you made about what participation means from the from the offset, especially. So it's not participation at a certain point; it's participation throughout a process, um, and just designing what participation actually means, rather than bringing in people to participate at the point where they have to, almost through legal uh, obligations. And I think that speaks to Marley's point about again co-designing uh, the app, but also co-designing co the app over a long term period. And actually working with people to feel that empowerment through through doing basically and through um through participation as well. But yeah, I think there's okay talking kind of about co-production and participation and the sort of different ways that occurs in practice, um, often not what we would like to see. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions that are coming into the the chat. Um, Elaine says thanks for the speakers. And has a question for Nina and Marley. So we'll go to Nina first, if that's okay. It's a I Holly think that's me. I, Holly think I, was saying, I was saying Nina, but yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's okay. It often happens. It's funny. Sorry, I'm it? getting mixed up with Nina. Sorry, Holly. No, people do. They always do that with my surname. I often get called Nina. <laughs> um, and um, how? So I guess your question relates to how whether natural capital and social capital approaches can fit together, and how that might happen, and. I think they definitely can, but I think both approaches aren't set in stone in terms of in terms of what they look like. But I think a particular um, way that they could usefully integrate or sort of um, overlap and inform against each other to sort of link that bigger picture of like the human nature system, if you like, um, would be to consider how social capacity or social capital and the processes that allow that so for example like through co-production things like these and how policies that feed into that to support it um policies and projects and activities i suppose um enable or maintain the flow of benefits between um nature and and people so if where you've got I don't know whether I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps not speaking particularly clearly, but what, what I mean is when you think about the system and I spoke about the additional capital, so where you've got technological, financial or human capital, then that's probably where social cap capital will come in or, and, and approaches for co-production. And then that would also feed into sort of the controls and governance that you've got around it that allows or enables people to have a say in how pressures or degradation or extraction of natural capital may be undertaken. Yeah, if that makes sense. But really that it's very flexible. So it's, it's the sort of thing that can can take whatever form you like. I think the important 
thing for me is that it the idea is to make people's the, the connections with people explicit and the values that people hold explicit even if they're not quantifiable or statistical which is generally what a lot of decision making is set up to um sort of fit in with well, thank you holly and my a question for you also um is there a hope that decision makers can engage with the app yes what's, what's sort of vision for that yeah, um, I thank you, Lynn, for that question. And it's a very important question. Um, so there is hope for decision makers to engage with the app. Um, but the question is, will they actually want to integrate the knowledge that is then embedded on it into the decisions that they are making? I remember for one of our workshops, we had like a, a, a demonstration workshop where we were kind of showing the application to a number of people within those coastal, coastal communities and one of the people or one of the institutions we went to was the was um I, um the municipality in Swakopmund and we were kindly turned down so they didn't really go through the app. They were just like, oh maybe if you guys are going to show it somewhere else then you can bring it then but we do not have time. So um instances like that do happen. However, for the community, what was very important for them was that that other people in the coastal towns to learn about the ocean and the benefits that it can kind of attain for them, like how it has kind of um, improved their livelihoods or their well-being for the now coastal communities that I worked with. Because one person, one of the coastal communities who works with seaweed, and she kind of takes seaweed extract to use in her garden. She was like, this is like valuable knowledge and people can actually use this to also create their gardens and those who are maybe having problems with um, buying um, vegetables and other stuff they can just create their gardens and this is what I want people to know they kind of want other coastal community members to learn from it however we're still in works to disseminate or to demonstrate their application to um, a greater audience than that is of the communities that we engaged with. Excellent. Thank you, Marley. Um, and we have another final question in the chat here from Rembrandt. And it's kind of the million dollar question uh, that we've been engaging with on the paper we've been writing. That's probably why it's taken so long to write. Is the idea of hierarchies of knowledge an existing legal concept? As I am not a lawyer, I wonder about that. And then goes on to say, I know many practices have been introduced in this session, but are there, let's call them legal successes to report based on the concept of hierarchies of knowledge? Maybe this is what everyone is talking about, but I would be interested to understand the practicalities of this concept of hierarchies of knowledge, philosophical or social. I, uh, I understand and subscribe to the concept, but I'm not clear yet how it works legally. <laughs> Who would like to take that one? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure even if I want to take that one, but um, I, so in, in response to the first question, I, 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 I did put, um, I guess an analogy yeah, um, in, in the chat, which I definitely trying to find now because I, I, I think the question was along the line of whether there are hierarchies in law or something along that line. But what, and my response was law by its very nature is um, hierarchical. Um, many, so I'm from the English legal system and the, it's a tiered um, structure. Um, but more importantly, I use the analogy of equ how equity entered the English legal system. One of the reasons for equity and uh, the equity entering the English legal system was because there was a large scale uh, marginalization of a majority of the population who were not noble. Because in that in in those days, it, um, if if you couldn't read, um, I believe was Latin, um, most of the judgments were in Latin and so on and so forth. No need to give a history lesson, but um, essentially this marginalized <laughs> this marginalized a large percentage of the population and who could not access justice. And equity was introduced as a 
so a, a way to in, expand the access to to justice and 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 create fairer conditions and and i think in many respects we are at that point at in international law uh in many respects uh some of which i mentioned in the presentation because i i think those who are marginalized and i shouldn't only say at international law but that we you know in where persons are being marginalized and impacted, they have grown impatient. Um, uh, I, with re respect to whether their successes, I would say that we have the ingredients, and they have been small victories. But we, these victories, you know, you know, such as the pronouncements, for example, in the Torres Islanders case, uh, and I do think the incorporation, for example, of in the final do a document of it, indigenous and local communities into the BBNJ instrument, as well as um, uh, moderately robust um, provisions for strategic environmental assessment are, are causes for optimism uh, because they open the door to, um, as I said, human rights approaches, which is the area which I, I think 10, 15 years or maybe even five years ago, I think this was the area that no one expected to explode like this, and and, and certainly has um has been the basis of much more optimism and concrete action than international environmental law or or, or trade law or, or other areas of law who are now being called to task or even law of the sea. So the, the, the hearing this this these two weeks in Hamburg is more than likely going to define the relationship with law of the sea that law of the sea has in respect to climate change and 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 how knowledge systems flow between the global north and global south. So um not uh maybe not a not a uh, a yes or no answer, but it it's a it, it's a complex issue, and because of the historical um you know it, it's it, it embedded in the history and politics it's it's gonna take a while to dismantle I think. Thanks, Alana. That's great. And yeah, I think just just to give some some context, it kind of we kind of came into the the idea of knowledge hierarchies. Just based on different perspectives, but because they were all engaging with ideas like participatory research or integrating different knowledge systems. And so the idea of knowledge hierarchies just kind of came out of there, um, as used in some literature, but it actually has been a bit of a trouble to find, you know, a body of literature that all engages with knowledge hierarchies as we are referring to them, um, which was kind of my fault for just putting that in the title. But hey, it's a... Uh, Part of, the, part of the fun of it. Um, but to be honest, it mostly comes from, at least from the perspectives that we've been talking about it, as Alana mentioned, it's from more from context of decolonial research, especially um, really looking at the dominance of certain knowledge systems through colonial processes that have become embedded in things like law and governance and science um, as a sort of dominant science throughout the globe and how that's how that undermined or suppressed or neglected other forms of knowledge and created this hierarchy that exists in these frameworks as well. So we're sort of, that's where we're engaging with it. But yeah, there's other knowledge hierarchies. When you Google knowledge hierarchies, other things will come up um, and other sort of research will come up as well. But for the most part, we've been engaging in it from, from that perspective. Hopefully our paper will address that and sort of explain that as well. Excellent. So Lisa, did I see your hand was up? Yeah, there you are. Yeah, hello everyone and thanks David and thanks to, to all of you for this fascinating panel. Um, as you know, I'm a big fan uh, and I, I, I love to know uh, what everybody's doing in the in the world of knowledge hierarchies and uh, I'm going to uh, start with a daunting, this is more of a comment than a question, but it's actually uh, a really uh, uh, what really fascinated me because I had the pleasure to be on the previous panel uh, organized by, by One Ocean Hub uh, about the gender uh, and uh, 
I just wanted to, to because there are a couple of people, I, I can see the names and the faces that were on the, on both uh, panels, but I don't think all of us were, uh, obviously. And uh, I just want to, to convey that there was a couple of really mirror messages uh, across these two panels. And uh, one of them is this anecdote that you, Alana, uh, told us about uh, the Fisher Folk um, uh, community member who said, okay, you gave us the access to the table but uh, you didn't give us the cutlery to enjoy the meal and uh, someone uh, more than one person actually at the gender panel um, uh, raised the notion of uh, to have a right officially on the paper and to be allowed let uh, or enable to exercise that right is not one and the same and they're often in the everyday world really different things so I would like to pun very much intended to 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 connect with the with Holly's topic to capitalize on the the diversity of the disciplines that we have at the table today, and to to just ask all of you if you can comment on how much does that cut through all of the disciplines and all of your work. How much does this uh, notion of, because this is something that I really, really super often hear across our disciplines when it comes to, to, to ocean and ocean governance and ocean health and uh, climate change and ocean climate nexus, is this notion problem issue of access. So uh, can you comment on access very broadly defined uh, from your context? Thanks, Billy. It's a good question. Who would like to take that? <laughs> All right. Molly, Alana, Polly, would anyone like to? Come in I have now? to apologise that I was. Um, I'm. I'm struggling. Can you just? Can you? Can you just reiterate? So the issue was access and access and so in relation to. I'm trying yeah. to think in relation to what I'm doing around. Can you just can you just recent re like summarize a minute? Uh, oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I just I got a little bit carried away. Sorry. It's it's basically the notion of access is something that I really uh, often hear across mm. who deal with uh, or scholars who deal with uh, either the law or the social sciences um, and all the other. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. So yeah, I the, the notion of access is something that I think cuts across everybody's work uh, across the hub when we talk about Pan Ocean Hub and about um, ocean climate nexus, uh, rights of child, rights of women and girls, um, and other other topics that that uh, we uh, tackle in the ocean context, and it's it sort of boils down to this notion of access. So uh, the access to the decision-making table, the access to the actual sort of equitable or equal knowledge co-production, where uh, like the, the decision of what scientific is in certain hands. Um, and sort of like just uh, the, the, so like being granted access on paper to different, um, uh, communities, to different uh, knowledge holders, to different stakeholders, um, how equitable, how equal, how inequitable, how does this uh, notion of access to the decision-making table, to the knowledge, uh, to the actual coast, to the ocean, um, to the heritage database, how does that come up in your research, if it, if it anyway? I hope that that made slightly more sense. No, it does. It's just very difficult to answer in the context of um, the global ocean because, and and I think that's the problem, isn't it? Is you've got this part, it's really it, integral part of the planet that delivers um, all of these things that are so important for global society. Yet people feel like they're very removed from it oh. because because I suppose in a way the information and the way this is exactly what we speak about when we talk about knowledge hierarchies is the data that's valued is largely inaccessible to to the lay person not only because these connections aren't drawn between how how the ecology or the, re the these regions might be important to them or to us um 
but also because the people aren't deemed to be stakeholders. And so you're not provided access to the table because there are no mechanisms for consultation. Because how do you consult global society? We don't know how to do that. So it's, um, so yeah, it's. <laughs> Thanks, Holly. Well, a, a future, a future, um, scientist or knowledge hierarchy. <laughs> Absolutely adorable. Um, I, I just my my comment, and it may provoke some more thought. Um, is that um knowledge and information is absolutely a a tool of 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 power and control and i think if we look historically not granting access to uh to information or even access to to, to protect your rights was um a, a mechanism of control and if we want to look at it in in contemporary times um and you know yeah, and this is what twill scholars for example argue their imbalances the imbalances between the global north north and global south do now translate it further in, into imbalances so for example um quite apart from investment in technology and so going forward there are a lot of 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 information held in archives in the global north. So for example, if I want to research on my country or in perhaps many, most of the Caribbean region, there's more sitting in London or Amsterdam than there is um, sitting in the Caribbean. And part of that is because we've done a horrible job at <laughs> preserving what we have. Yes, I, I, I can see that, but also accessing this information is part of the the challenge. Um, there's also the challenge um, which Marley's project touches on technology and, and so for example the both the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Convention on on sorry the Paris Agreement uh, um, touch on this uh, as as well as the Parent Treaty um, transfer of technology from more developed to less developed countries now within the context of the climate change convention um this is more and more this get this is getting more and more complex because it's not a black and white issue um which is uh, you know and and those of you who might be keeping in in uh will recognize that the the BRICS group which was initially the in within the climate change convention, the group that was neither fish nor fowl is rapidly expanded, and that that will have implications for many areas of 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 um of of not only knowledge hierarchies but the access of decision making, uh, world econ economics and finance. So, um, that those are just my thoughts. Sorry. <laughs> No, that's okay. great. Thanks, Alana. Marley, do you have any thoughts on this as well? I want to make sure you've got time to come in. Um, um, there was just a question I was that I really wanted to answer from Kathleen. Oh yeah, please, I wanted to ask you that one for you. Please. Okay, cool. yeah. but um, regard regarding what Melita kind of talked about access, um, it's it's a very important point because, like you said, access is kind of a universal thing. And then, in my in my um perspective, when it comes to technology, like Kalana says, it's already a big challenge on its own. Um, maybe not so much here in the global north, but in in the global south, technology infrastructure is not easily accessible as it is in other parts of the world. Um, and I guess that's why when we worked on on the research that we're working on, some of the participants were like, um, maybe they, they were like, okay, we don't really know how to use this, 
but we've seen because we went through an exploration phase where they kind of went through a variety of other technologies that kind of preserved and documented knowledge that's been kind of used um, in other countries. And they were like, maybe the same way that it's been done in other countries, it can be done here and other people can kind of learn about um, all of these ocean benefits through this technology. However, with that said, the technology itself is kind of decolonizing in a sense that not everyone can kind of have access to it because it's not supported on all kinds of mobile phones. And these are just kind of the accessible challenges that are kind of related to technology um, all in all. With it being said that all of these companies that kind of govern the policies, uh, technological policies, um, don't make it possible for some phones to have functionalities that support a few applications and only other phones. And mostly those are the um, high end phones, like the expensive phones, which not too many people can can afford. So it's definitely something that um, needs to be looked at. Um, and I think that is honestly going to take a whole long time for that gap to be breached. Um, but then going back to Kathleen's um, question on distrust. So I, I actually did not encounter this with the communities that I've worked with because um, um, I'm primarily interested in participatory work and the work that we do is always over a period of time. And what happens is that you kind of build a relationship and trust with those communities. So they really put themselves into the research. And it's not just for the research because for some of them, they're like, it's a platform for us to gain knowledge and it's also a platform for us to teach. And that's now the researchers that I've been taught. However, it did come up in some of the workshops that we're having with the participants that they've but they've attended a few other workshops and seminars. But the challenge they have is that the the researchers or institutions they just come in for that one day. It's a whole day workshop. Then they talk and ask questions, get answers, and then they are gone. And they maybe see them again two years later, and they kind of feel like they are being exploited. They kind of feel like okay. Maybe the knowledge is going somewhere and being implemented somewhere, but we don't know that. We don't see any product. We don't see any results. So yeah, those are the challenges that kind of also need to be looked at. Thank you. Thanks, Marley. And yeah, I just wanted to kind of pick up on that point as well about, about access and just thinking about when we talk about access, how we also need to think about who has the resources to access knowledge and how is it used? Because um, knowledge was always co-produced during the colonial period. I mean, it was always co-produced knowledge, but who actually receives credit, recognition of you know, global audiences for that knowledge were Europeans and Westerners who accessed indigenous and local knowledges, extracted that knowledge, and then presented it as their own expert knowledge. And you know, systems of co-production, you know, even if they are set up to be, you know, they're meant to be positive um, and equitable, sometimes they can replicate these same these same patterns if you're not constantly sort of reiterating and re-revising such approaches. And as Marley says, if it's not, you know, long-term sort of equitable, trustful relationships that are being built there. So you can have the sort of best bug in the world, but you can re replicate those knowledge hierarchies just as a result of, of the actions that you're taking. Sorry, Rembrandt, please. Yeah, in, in, in context of access, I, I, I also feel that you can turn it around like, um, most people do not understand the sea at all. I mean, I live in the Netherlands. We have a coastline of a half the country is very close to the sea. If you talk to people that literally live a couple of miles away from the sea, they they have no relation. They have no clue, sort of, so to speak. I mean, I'm exaggerating and simplifying. So there, there's also there's also this this question of access of how to experience the sea how to understand the sea and the creatures in the sea. So one of the sessions in, in this uh, week of, of beautiful sessions was uh, somebody at the Azores had made, um, that was this morning, I think, had made um, uh, recordings of sounds of whales and dolphins and then did this research with the community of some of the Azores islands. And then the, the artists the musicians started to experiment with these sounds. And in the end, there was a there was a, a kind of a festival of a kind of a, a project where it was presented to the people, other people. And so one of the things she said, but I'm I, it's in my words, is what is is that this this exercise 
uh, because it was not like cognitive information, but it was a different kind of relation cre created a connection, created kind of an access that, that wasn't there before. So I, I was really enthusiastic about it because it sort of turned around the, the notion of access to the, to the, to the creatures or the sea from, from the start. And so what I find very irritating and unacceptable is that the beautiful project that you're talking about, Marley, or, or also the, ex the examples that you mentioned, that there is so little uh, movement or so little interest from let's say classical researchers or or classical uh, scientists or whatever to go to the, the quote unquote indigenous people and that's the wrong way of putting it but i just i i find that mind boggling that 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 we are not using that kind of access that we don't using that kind of understanding or that close relationship i i can i don't get that but anyway, that's more a comment than a question. I know, thank you very much. I think it's a really important comment to make. Um, thank you. I'm just very wary of time. So we're now actually hitting the half past mark. So I think I should probably bring the panel to an end. But thank you so much to all our panelists um, and to everyone for asking questions and for keeping the discussion going. We were going to go into breakout groups, but uh, we didn't have time. But in the breakout groups, I was just going to ask everyone to reflect on thinking about what knowledge hierarchies exist in your work. How do they manifest themselves? What challenges do you face in addressing and working through these? And also just thinking about what is the long term and short term impact of maintaining such knowledge hierarchies as well. So maybe I can leave you with those reflections rather than breakouts and you can maybe email them or something. Um, but yeah, I want to just thank everyone for for coming along and yeah it's been such an interesting discussion and thank you to all our presenters as well so we just a quick clap for everyone that's good there we go some people are stream clapping amazing <laughs> thank you it's a, and yeah have good evenings good days wherever you are and uh, nice to meet you all <laughs> thank you everyone <laughs> thanks everyone lovely thank session. you bye thank, thank you, you.